thank you so much for tuning in. Um, this is a special moment because we have had now um, perhaps five months of, of space between when this project was first kind of introduced uh, to this group of four artists and today when we are going to get to see a little bit of what they've been working on. Um, my name is David Wilson. I'm an artist and uh, work with Berkeley Art Museum Pacific Film Archive on a number of uh, program related plans. And uh, this is something that I'm very excited to, to share with you all today. Um, uh, Jenny Hirth from the estate of Eli Leon uh, reached out with a really beautiful invitation of raw material of some of Eli's collection of textiles, um, which we were, were made available for some new work. And so it was kind of this uh, opportunity to create new work with this kind of material that is wrapped up in the legacy um, that is part of what we are seeing play out at the in the galleries of BAM PFA right now in the Rosie Lee Tompkins retrospective uh, and the collection of 3000 quilts, uh, African American quilts that have been donated to the museum. And um, so knowing this legacy, we we felt that there was an incredible opportunity to um, continue continue to see it create and seed new new life and new work. Um, so connecting with Jenny, there was this kind of transfer where the she worked with Eli in, in the kind of tail end of his life and, and made sure to kind of uh, take care of, of him and take care of this incredible collection of material and artwork. And there was a care there that she that she had for for this for this um, collection of fabric and textiles that um, I could feel immediately just the kind of um, sense of responsibility. And I think when someone collects, when is a collector of things, they, they, um, they see it and they see beyond it. They see its history, they see its potential use, they see all these, they're kind of like what's packed into this. And so um, I think for her, it was also a really wonderful um, kind of realization of potential to to know that this collection of material could be passed on to some contemporary artists um, who could kind of realize its potential and kind of activate it as as material for new artwork. Um, so with that collection of fabric, um, we wanted to um, think about the spirit of improvisation, which is uh, a key element to the the quilts that we see on view at, at the Rosalie Tompkins show and the kind of idea of the remnant the the thing that's left behind and and kind of working with it and being in dialogue with it um, so this collection of material um, kind of limiting ourselves to what it is uh, as a collection and, and working with it um, all each of the artists had to kind of com come into their own improvisation and thinking about um, what strikes them. So I, I kind of collected these many, many bins of, of uh, material that was deep in storage in Jenny's house. And now it's has kind of transferred into storage in my house. And hopefully this will be the first of a few iterations of this project where we'll, where we'll see it um, getting into the hands of some incredible artists like the artists that we're gonna hear from today. So I think I'll, I'll wrap that up uh, for my little introduction, but I just want to welcome you all and then and just say um, thank you to Jenny Hirth for making this project and this material available. And thank you to the artists for participating. Um, Angela Hennessy, Rama Khan O.R. Wisters, Olayaton Colander Scott, and Lucasa Branfman Verissimo are the four artists who we celebrate today and are so excited to hear from, hear about um, their process of receiving these bags and bags of material and and kind of unpacking it literally and and you know in and thinking through what they could do with it so um i think we'll turn turn the mic over to our artists and uh we'll start with lucasa thank you so much david and jenny and the whole estate for kind of initiating this collaboration it feels so right um, and so honored to now have like 
all these remnants of Eli's collection living and breathing in my studio. Um, so I thought I would just screen share and show some images and of like research and process that I've been um, kind of working with. Um, and I brought a portion of my piece that I'm working on and it's hanging behind me. Um, and okay. Um, so yeah, I'm Luqueza Bramfman Verissimo. I use they, them, she, her pronouns. Um, and I kind of bounce back between uh, Powhatan land, which is Richmond, Virginia, and Olone land, which is um, Oakland, California. Um, so just a little bit of an intro of what's going on in my brain and my studio these days. Um, I've been thinking a lot about um, layering of histories and stories and um, layering of these histories and stories in different locations. Um, I recently kind of transported part of my um, life um, to uh, Virginia. Um, and so as someone who's very much like deeply interwoven within um, kind of Bay Area history and um, communities here. I've been thinking a lot about like the resistance stories that we carry with us wherever we go and um, really kind of using our stories to be like a lens to examine and make new communities in. Um, and so this is a piece that I've been working on, a series of transparent banners that are on mylar. Um, and as I was kind of just like digging through um, and making this work, I was thinking a lot about, um, you know, pattern um, and cloth being a really important way of how I choose to tell stories and camouflage and um, legibility. And so much of that is inspired by, um, you know, like textile history and, um, coding and storytelling and kente cloth and quilt making. And so to be able to receive this work at this moment that I'm kind of like laying all these histories on top of each other felt like just beautiful timing. And so, um, um, yeah, these are some more images of what's going on in my brain beyond um, this project, but definitely have been materials and ways that I've kind of played around and approached um, this improvisational collaboration. Um, so yeah, these are some um, in progress images, um, just kind of, you know, thinking about the thinking a lot about like the surface and um, the pattern of the quilt itself, um, deconstructing it to kind of like retell a story. Um, and, you know, I felt so initially like, oh, I'm just gonna like go into the cloth and be with the fibers and then laying them all out. I realized that, you know, my inner printmaking self came out in terms of like making this print off of them. Um, and what would it look like to make a painting that was the quilt? Um, or, I don't know, just kind of play around with, with yeah, the, these layers and maybe a quilt not looking the way that the material was delivered to me. Um, so yeah, my process was just kind of like laying and making my own quilt with the scraps and then, um, kind of putting the mylar on top and then painting on top of that. Um, I This is uh, some images of just like research material that I've been using for the past few years that um, kind of reintroduced and looked at them and examined um, them next to these um, um, layered pieces from Eli's collection. Um, and so I thought I would would bring them out just to talk a little bit more about like some of the some of the prints and paintings that I'm getting from the original um, remnants um, 
also have added layers looking a lot at um, Rosie Lee Tompkins work, um, work of the G's Bend Quilt Collective, um, which is what this book is. Um, on the left is um, some African kente cloth. Um, so again, kind of like going in and pulling and um, kind of reclaiming and, and, and kind of piecing together these different um, histories of the diaspora together. Um, and then on the right is an image, a close up from one of the Rosie Lee Tompkins quilts that's um, on view at BAMFA. Um, again, on the left is a rosy piece. And then on the right um, are more kind of um, images from this um, African textile and cloth book um, that I have and reference and, and use in the creation of, of what's becoming of this remnant piece. Um, so yeah, I don't know exactly what it's gonna become, but it feels like this um, object that's just revealing itself and really trying to like, honor the improv and not have a plan and just be like, maybe this will be a banner. Maybe this will want to, you know, live on in the ways that cloth does, or um, maybe it'll get cut up and, and integrated into, into my other work. Um, so yeah, this is what it's looking like these days. Um, but to be continued, there were just so many incredible like clothing items that were in the mix of my um, pile that I really want to add to some like really beautiful, like one part of a boxer needs to go in there. Um, so um, yeah, I'm kind of excited to have this opportunity this evening to also hear what um, my peer fellow incredible artists are up to with this work and how maybe all of y'all's sharing will influence the future of what this work becomes. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lukeza. Yeah. Looking ex ex very exciting. Um, and yeah, it seems like it's connecting to works that um, I, I see in your, you know, kind of in your past, but definitely new, new territory, which is exciting. So I, um, yeah, just wanted to note that a lot of the, the textiles were Eli's clothing that he, he kept of his own, which is kind of interesting, especially when someone passes to, you know, to kind of, you feel them in the, in a very specific way, of course, in their material and in their clothing or in their boxers or whatever that, that <laughs> item might be. But um, yeah, there's a personification of this collector of this collection. Uh, and again, there was uh, a very beautiful uh, and emotional moment of, of transfer when Jenny passed it on because there was this, for her as someone who was very close with Eli, um, these items called called him right right up. So uh, I know that it's exciting to see see them kind of kind of coming coming to life. Um, thank you again. And, and if anyone has any questions, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom there. Feel free to type things in and the artist can kind of uh, either keep an eye on it and type, a, type something back or in the end, I'll, we'll kind of do a little conversation Q&A. Um, okay, uh, we'll keep things rolling and, and hear from Ramakan. Hello there, thank you, David. Uh, I'm very happy to be a part of this project. Um, and there are many reasons why. One is that uh, I met uh, Eli Leon a uh, decade, maybe a decade or so ago when I was the curator uh, at the FFO Museums and we're trying to organize an exhibition of uh, quilts at the, uh, at the airport. Uh, also, my mother, my grandmother, and my great-grandmother all made quilts. And I made quilts with my grandmother, which is how I started my, my 
uh, social art project my, you know, called Crochet Jam, where she allowed me to break the pattern of her quilt. She had already had a pattern on there. And when I was navigating, I think I was about 10 or 12, I was navigating not very successfully the, my own sexual identity in homophobic North Carolina in the 1960s. And my mother, my grandmother said one, said one day, you know, she said, come over here, boy, and help me with this quilt. And I thought, that's the last thing I want to do. And you keep trying to, you know, adolescent trying to figure out, you know, who you are, who you are sexually, and how that, and how all that might not wind up very well, uh, sewing with your grandmother. But she allowed me to break the pattern. And so she said, any color, any pattern you want, I will show you how to add it to my quilt. She didn't say, now look here, boy, here's the color, here's the pattern, here's how you cut it. She said, any color, any pattern you want, you can add it to my quilt. And it was a healing moment for me because it, it, it showed me in very innumerable ways that I was embraced, I was cared for, I was appreciated in a world outside of her home that was hostile, ag aggressive, angry, um, and in some ways, that world has not changed that much. But the world of healing through fabric, through community, through uh, uh, sharing ideas together, uh, has also been with us as well. And I believe it's more profound than the negative. And so with the, with the, with the, with the quilts that I received, the, the tops, not quilt, the tops that I received, and also I made a Although I didn't bring it to the headlands, I, I made a, uh, a sculpture piece out of um, Eli Leon's clothes that kind of, it kind of it's kind of like a, um, uh, a, a totem to him. And I'll, I'll share that through images later. Uh, but right now, I want to show you what I've been working on. So I'm going to bring my camera on my, on my computer in front of the panel. So bear with me as I do this. So it's going to be a little, a little choppy. Okay. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, good. So this is what, this is one of the panels. Mekon, you're a little, a little quiet. Could you speak a little closer to your... Uh, oh. Okay, we can hear you. It's it's a little mumble. We but yeah.
see in what way they could look like outside painting or map or just or just not worry about how it looks, but just enjoy the process. So luckily I'm here at the Hickman because if I see your home, if it's in my home, that wall would not would not exist. I would not have enough space to create that big piece of the scale if I wasn't here. But luckily I am, and luckily the the, uh, the opportunity to be able to improvise. Well, I really didn't quite know how I was going to uh, conceptualize, you know, or improvise. It seems like it's still a little difficult to hear some of what you're saying. Um, I oh, wonder if maybe maybe you could take your computer back okay, to right. the location before because it was a little clearer then. Okay. That's yeah. That's that's a little clear. Thank you. I think it's worth noting that uh, Ramakan is doing a residency out of the Headlands, which is that incredible room that. You, you're, you're seeing part of is this, uh, the, the boominess of that space is part of its, uh, its beauty. So that, that's what we're hearing. Anyway, yeah, thank but, you. Yeah, that's what you're hearing, but yes. Uh, okay, so uh, without, without repeating too much and staying within my 10 minutes, or maybe my 10 minutes is over, I don't know, is it? We, we are in awe of your piece. It's, it, you know, the, the sound can just recede and we, we are just soaking up your, your piece. It's so, so beautiful. Um, well, thank you. Um, but but I, I, I can't emphasize, you know, more how, how exciting it is to, you know, to have a, an experience that ties me all the way back to a childhood memory. Uh, to a childhood memory that that takes that through fabric that takes me through my my career as a as a, as a curator at at the at the museum at the airport and to meeting Eli you know who our show was going to do at the, at the airport and then be able to have access to um, fabric and his and um, artifacts fabric from his from his home and, and he's collected and also to know that these ones were made by other African American women. You know, I mean, the continuity, I could not ask for better continuity than this. So <laughs> I'll leave it at that for now. So thank you so much. <laughs> Wonderful. And yeah, and, and Jenny just offered a little note um, how she, she's recognizing fabrics herself. So yeah, the, the continuity and the, the connections continue. Um, thank you so much for that, Ramakan. You're very so, welcome. Yeah. Did you say, um, are you you're continuing to work on that piece, or do you feel like you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And and again, Ramakan's out of the headlands, and you you were saying there's going to be a open studio time, so maybe that's a good yeah. Idea. It's going to start uh, July. Oh, sorry, June seventeenth, uh, um, and people can come into the space here where I am between one and five. So June seventeenth, it's going to be. Uh, that's, I think that's a Thursday, Friday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. No, Thursday, Friday, and Sunday. Thursday, Friday, and Sunday, starting uh, June uh, 17th until July 17th. Wonderful, wonderful. So hopefully people can get a chance to, to take a look in person. Please um, do. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll, we'll uh, keep things moving and again, have some time to revisit uh, questions and, and, uh, and have a chat um, at the end. So, uh, Olayatan, we'd love to hear from you. Hi, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. I received the bag of materials from Eli Leon Shortly before I was headed for a trip, I opened up the bag and said, <gasps> okay, and I closed it up. It was like, this was such a treasure and it was, it was really overwhelming at first look at what was gonna happen with all of these materials. I really wanna thank Jenny um, 
for my connection at all with Leon, for having met him and years before that, having read the, seen the books and materials he put together and his love of African-American of quilting period, but African-American quilting and quilters was just a real heart, touching heart part for me. So it was a, 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 an extra opportunity, an extra pleasure to be able to, to work with these materials. And while I was, while I was going through these materials I, and beginning to, to work on them, I was really in touch with Eli. It's like, you know, I, I didn't at first realize that these were his clothes. So some of these were his clothing. And that's, oh, I don't even know how to say that. That's, it's almost emotional. I mean, somebody wore these, there, there's some remnant of them is in them. And, and it really connected with what I wanted to do. I wanted to, to acknowledge ancestors. Uh, Eli obviously is not a direct personal ancestor of mine, but you know, he's passed on and he's left something of him here. And it made me think about what we do to honor worst um, ancestors. And I thought a lot about the Egungun and masquerades in Benin and parts of uh, Nigeria. And I am fascinated and have been fascinated with them. So I wanted to work with that notion in mind, using cloth from, from Eli's collection, little bits of cloth Ankara and mud cloth and things that were rooted in Africa in honor of our all of and um, yeah to play with that idea some so I'm in progress with working on what is not an Egungu masquerade because I am not qualified nor do I know how that is done but my inspiration from Egungu masquerade and my honoring and remembering of Eli I'm going to turn my camera around to get a glimpse of what I'm doing so far. Um, sorry, it's a, I'm not up a close on it. It is not, it, right now it is on a structure because it cannot stand independently, but it will not be eventually. With, with a big master costume, you have layers of fabric, more to be, at it and there's so much so much richness from his fabrics that I have to add the fabric is to signify the rhythm of life the rhythm of life that is left to us when someone is passed on and Eli is beyond our understanding right now but he has left us some little evidence of him having been here both in his actual clothing and other collections there were some quilt top pieces and other things that are in there. It was, it was a treasure. Every, you know, I thought I had gotten to the end of it and it's not the end. Every time I go to the bottom, there's another piece that, oh, I have to use a piece of this. So I'm really celebrating ancestors and our lineage, each of our lineage with the piece that I'm, I'm working on. So that's all I have to say right now. Wonderful. And um, are there, so you, in terms of your, your, I know this is an unfolding process for you as well. Do you, do you feel like you're at a, you know, I feel like in different, in different moments of a project, you, you find kind of waves of momentum and do you, do you feel like you're, yeah, how would you describe your working moment? Well, my, my working moment is Hmm, how is it is I know where what feeling I want to have yeah. down the road. Nice. So <laughs> and and it is and then I find another piece like there's a lace tablecloth, fabulous lace tablecloth right. that's right. going to be a sculptural part in the piece that's that's stiffened to be sculptural. There are um, other elements like that that will stand on top of the piece hmm. to I don't know, I guess to, to mirror the idea of life continuing, the actual, like the body is gone, but you know, the spirit is continuing as the clock might as well. So, and my challenge is to have, to have movement in a piece that does not have 
the actual ancestor inside it moving it. Mm. As you would see, if you would look up like a Gunga masquerade dances, you'll see there's a lot of movement and there's you know, an entity in it moving. There won't be an entity in this, it will actually be just a piece. So that's my challenge. Beautiful. Thank you, Elayatan. Thank you. Yeah. Well, and we'll hear now from Angela Hennessy. Hi, it's so good to see you all. It's been a minute. Indeed. Um, so, gosh, um, I'm just like thrilled and excited to be included in this project. Thank you, David. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I was really thinking a lot about what it means to inherit material, you know, art materials. I mean, I use that term really broadly, but to inherit materials from someone else's practice. And it definitely got me thinking a lot about, you know, what will be left, what I will leave behind when I die and how I might disseminate, you know, bits and pieces. I mean, I have a lot, of, my studio is really full right now. Um, so that, you know, just part of my own, you know, kind of thought process around it. Um, was very much about, you know, feeling that se that sense of inheritance um, and a sense of lineage. Um, I am, I'm just going to share my screen here. So one of the first things that I did when I got this <coughs> um, bag from David was basically to dump everything out on, I have this giant uh, piece of paper that I keep on the floor in my studio, big white piece of paper, and to kind of take inventory and to see, you know, what it was that I was actually, you know, present to what I had inherited. And it's something that I talk to my students about, you know, when they're trying to decide like where to begin, you know, so it's a, it's a way um, of kind of taking stock of, of what is, you know, what is present and what is here. And so this was really kind of an interesting process too, just kind of reviewing all of the materials and thinking about color palette. Um, and wanting to, um, you know, to locate the color palette, right? And color is something in my work. I'm sorry, let me just get this. Here we go. Um, so color is something that's really important to me. And, and, you know, for people who know my work, I primarily work with the color black or with the kind of spectrum of uh, from kind of golden, you know, browns uh, down to a black. And so I kind of instinctively started with the black, but what I also kind of discovered was really wanting to, um, wanting to embrace some of Rosie Lee Tompkins ideas about improvisation and thinking about, you know, how could I relate to these materials? How could I interact with these materials? And so I found myself kind of in the studio just making some sort of, you know, weird videos thinking about, uh, you know, how, how cloth, um, how cloth reveals things, even when it is concealing information too, and thinking about bodies, thinking about gestures. Um, I do a lot of rituals in my practice. Uh, and so it became a way to just kind of explore like what happens when I literally like take on a piece of fabric and you know, what, what is still read of my body through the cloth, um, that relationship between the cloth as a body as well, um, and thinking about gestures for rituals. And so, um, let me, sorry. And then, you know, I came back to a practice in my work that is um, a, a twisting process that I do with, primarily with hair, um, when I'm working with hair, taking long linear elements and then doing like a, a, a twist. It's basically like a rope making technique. It's a two ply rope. And so I took, I started with all of the black materials and cut those down into strips. And then they get layered in and twisted into these long braided um, rope pieces, which I'm actually, I will show, um, I'm gonna hold up this, this ball. You can kind of, I'll show some other pictures, but you can see sort of what it looks like as a big giant ball when it is uh, spun up just like, you know, a piece of, um, just like yarn or some other kind of string material. Sorry, here we go. So the strips, you know, cutting down the strips on the right, which that was a whole interesting process, thinking about garment construction as well. Um, and then they get twisted into these ropes on the left over here. Um, so, you know, lines and knots are things that I think about quite a bit in the studio. And uh, I'm working toward, I have a show coming up at part two gallery in downtown Oakland. 
in August. And so I'm, I'm really kind of thinking more about um, signs and symbols. And that was something that really resonated with me with Rosie Lee Tompkins work, right? Thinking about the way that she used numbers and letters um, and using abstract shapes and, and very much following these sort of ideas around improvisation. Um, but I'm, you know, kind of just experimenting. I don't know exactly what everything is going to be, but I have, you know, as I work, one of the things about being a textile artist and something that, um, you know, a textile sensibility that I'm really interested in is thinking about how, um, how larger scale objects are built from parts and pieces, right? And we can see that with quilt blocks, right? Starting out with squares or small sections that then slowly um, accumulate to build up to something, um, you know, a larger work. And then this is one of the other pieces that I discovered um, in, in my pile, in my bag, um, that was already, you know, this is how, how it came to me. Um, which I, uh, you know, I'm assuming that this was something that Rosie Lee Tompkins had started, or maybe it was, you know, part of something else or going to be something else. Um, but it, it made me think about divination cloths and how, you know, a cloth will be laid out. Um, and then, you know, a set of objects, you know, often in African cosmologies, you have all kinds of shells and coins and different items that will then be cast onto the cloth, right? So the cloth represents a sacred space, right? It represents an intersection between the living and the dead, right? This is a place where information comes in from the ancestors. Um, and so this is, I think, probably the, the uh, the, the part of all of these materials that I'm most excited about right now and was actually just kind of a recent discovery. Um, but so I'm working on a set of objects that will be used as part of a divination practice that will be, um, that will go on to this cloth. And some of these things are found objects. Um, there's some of the ivory soap beads, which is something that I've done in the past where I carve uh, shapes and beads out of ivory soap. So there's a couple of those objects and then um, some metal objects and things that relate to my background in metal smithing and jewelry. Um, so this is, you know, of course, all still very much in, in process, in progress. Um, and then I wanted to just show a couple of kind of funny images at the end for another project that I just completed with one of my uh, collaborators, Tahira Rashid. This is for um, our collective called Sea Black Women. And um, we did this kind of funny uh, video animation thing with these two gay Barbies. And we used their, their dresses and their head wraps are um, scraps of cloth <laughs> from the collection. Um, but these, they kind of, um, they're sort of in this like other world and thinking about, um, thinking about cosmology, thinking about planets, thinking about the earth. Um, and so it's, you know, I'm just showing a couple of images. I wanted to end kind of on a light note to think about also though, this idea of inheritance and how, um, you know, information, um, culture, knowledge, uh, language, and of course textiles are, are all passed on and kind of circulating. So I was thinking about how, you know, just even like little, some of the small scraps or small pieces from this collection will, I'm imagining that they will be disseminated in many ways in my practice. Um, but, you know, and also just in, in some kind of fun, surprising ways as well. Wonderful. Yeah, that, that's amazing. Like you said, just to think about the studio and the life of a material in your studio and how sometimes it, it does take years for that, you know, the, they, it just plays out. It's just kind of a slow, you know, long play of, of the material finding its way into your life and work. So, um, yeah. And uh, again, I just keep thinking how as someone who collects material, raw materials to like know that there there's that, that potential is being is being met is you know you can you can imagine that being the highest highest praise um mm -hmm. I, I wonder if you just want to there's a nice question in the q a i can read to you angela it says um while you or maybe you could start i guess is while you all work do you imagine rosie talking to you as you work mm -hmm. um help uh, problem solve or encourage you? What does she say? So yeah, this this kind of like, I think you've all touched on kind of hearing or feeling the the kind of 
the, the other players in, in the room as you're working a little bit. But. Yeah, that's definitely something that I have been um, thinking about quite a bit. And, you know, part of my practice is around um, naming the dead and really um, cultivating a relationship with my ancestors, um, you know, which include, of course, biological ancestors, but also chosen ancestors and, and a whole kind of extended community. Um, so, I mean, I find that, you know, when we think about what does it mean to communicate or be in communication with the dead and, and given that, um, you know, Rosie Lee Tompkins is not a direct ancestor to me, but I, I think of that in terms of, you know, the sort of wider community of textile artists. And so I've, I've begun to think of her as family in that way. Um, I find that, you know, there's like times in the studio that, um, you know, it's like when you think you have an idea and it's like this idea that comes from you, but I'm, I'm now beginning to think more of like, oh, that idea actually came from someone else, <laughs> you know, and sometimes it will just show up as like a, a, a color that will jump out or a particular shape or even, I mean, one of the objects that, um, that one of the items of clothing that that I discovered was like this beautiful kind of like loose silk blouse. So I've started wearing the blouse when I'm working on this piece, you know, to just really think. And, you know, I don't know that this is necessarily a blouse that she wore particularly, but I like that feeling of, you know, that I'm building a relationship with her. Um, and, you know, I certainly have been thinking about you know, oh, like, what would she think of this or, you know, things like that. So I, I hope, you know, as I get to know the materials more, you know, it's, it, it has been a slow process for me of really receiving all of the materials and wanting to give time and space to kind of get to know them and to understand like what, you know, I, I see, okay, this pile and what is all of that energy that then, you know, comes along with it. And so it's really, to me, it's really about being in, in relationship with that and leaving a lot of room for um, not necessarily having the answers, you know? I mean, I, I haven't had any moments where, you know, Rosie like spoke to me as like, oh, this or that, but, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm building a relationship with her. Beautiful, yeah. Well, though, when it, when it comes to uh, communing with the ancestors, communing with, with the past, one also has to remember that there is no life without death, and there is no death without life. So in a way, we're always with death. We're more with death alive than we probably are when we are no longer here, depending on how, depending on how you perceive life after death. So, um, so I feel as though that in some ways, we, I am communing with, um, with the ancestors by how I navigate the, the complexity, the immense complexity of life, um, knowing that at any second, death is as close to me as the skin on my body or the hair in my head. And that's the same type of navigation that my ancestors, all of them and everyone's ancestors, either consciously or unconsciously have to navigate, calmly or otherwise. And how do they do that? And in my, for my family, particularly it's matrilineal, the men did, the men did other things. But the women create, created their art, explored their world, their pain, their love, their joys through fabric. And they made beautiful music with fabric. And they cried in that fabric and they slept in that fabric and they, their you know, I, I know that my grandmother made, made quilts for me out of old, old fabrics, old clothes that I wore, that my brother wore, that my mother wore, and that I'm looking with old fabrics that my relatives who are not blood relatives also cut and hand sewed and made things together. And I like to think that they were doing it within a community, community or family setting, but it doesn't matter if it's true or not. Um, if it is, it's great. If it isn't, it's great. But at least I still know the power of how how um, uh, artists who work with, with fabric and quilts also are artists who work with their emotions and navigate and can and they 
wrestled their emotions to the ground. I'm talking about very strong women here who had to be as strong, had, had to be as strong, if not stronger, than the men they marry or the children that they bore. And that's not to me, it's very, it's very symbolic in Saturday. That, that's what I work with. And when I decided no longer to try to be an artist who work with traditional materials and go back to something that's very familiar, which is fabric, things become, you know, I'd be able to to walk between the, the, the veil of um, a very thin veil between between the waking world and the dream world. In the same way I'll have to walk between that veil of the living and those who have gone beyond. And fabric is the is the, for me is the conduit that helps me navigate that thing. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it also feels like like when I got the pile, I um, laid it out on a big table that's in the middle of the studio, in my studio. And um, just thinking about like, I don't know, in my mind, I'm imagining us all, all of us gathering around a table and um, sharing space and just whether it's, you know, with Rosie or with all the folks that Eli brought into his collection and his legacy. Um, there's something about like the power that that cloth has brought us all into this space in a way that like we all kind of like float around in the bay and interweave at different moments. But today Eli brought us here and um, yeah, something about thinking, I don't know, thinking about like not necessarily needing to know all of the, not needing to know where like each piece of the cloth came from, but knowing that it came from this place that is now bringing us together. Something about that I think um, has like fueled this process for me and also feels, yeah, just, just dreaming and imagining those folks and that history at a table with me in my studio and now all of you with me too. I wonder if, so, if oh yeah, Olayatan, go ahead. I, I just wanted to make, a, to acknowledge Rosie and Eli and to say the thing that resonated when Rosie comes up for me and Eli as well, but particularly Rosie and the other African-American quilters is the sense, is the knowledge of their independence. They're owning themselves and expressing themselves in their own way. And Eli, you know, it wasn't like every other person was collecting quilts or collecting African-American quilts. Eli was an independent. He was clear about what he loved and what he collected and what he honored. And I feel them, I feel that sitting next to me. I feel that, um, I don't know, it's not camaraderie, but that, that, that sense of ownership, being able to own your shelf and, and do your work and to look and see and to express very, very strongly. And they came up in this project, particularly with all these different cloths and I have much appreciation for that. Well, uh, before we wrap up, I'm wondering if if any any of the artists uh, had questions for each other, perhaps about sharing, just hearing each other's uh, thoughts on their their work. Anybody have any thoughts there? It's nice to hear. It feels like you you all kind of had your own, like Lucasa was saying, you each you know had your own process of. Uh, diving into this kind of uh, mystery bag of, of material and kind of uncovering your own associations and, and kind of the, that act of imagination is such a part of it too and, and wondering and, and kind of getting to create your own narratives and stories about these pieces that are kind of passing from hands to hands. Um, so, and... Um, I wanted to, yeah. I wanted to just say something about that because I was thinking too about, um, you know, when I first got the bag, I was thinking you know, like, oh, should I make a quilt? Like, should I try to do something, you know, like Rosie would do? But I'm, I'm a textile artist, but I'm not a quilter, you know? So it took me a minute to kind of think about, 
you know, like what my responsibility was to her and, and to her work and, you know, feeling like a great honor and respect in receiving the materials, right? So I was just curious, like what that process was like for, for other, for the other artists in terms of like seeing Rosie's work and understanding, you know, her aesthetic and, you know, what, what she, the ideas that she was working with and then how that met with, you know, like Ramakan with your work, things that you're doing, you know, with each of you, like how, what, what that sort of um, relationship then is between Rosie's work and, you know, each of us, our individual work. Well, uh, let's see. Keza, you were you described your piece. I mean, you used the the word quilt in describing your piece. Um, was that is that a word that you've used in thinking about pieces in the past? Yeah, I mean, in many ways, like I think about the quilt form, but maybe don't name it as that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think something about. I mean, I like quilts are my like, I love going to quilts to, I don't know, have I, quilts feed me and that legacy in so many ways, but I'm not necessarily a quilt maker. And um, I definitely, I think when I was beginning to like process and think about what this work would be, become, it felt like, I don't know, almost like an invitation to dive in and like claim quilting, but through like my language and way of making art. Um, and I think because also like David and the whole Bamfa crew was so much about like, how does this work also feed you and your work and um, can, can look all the ways. Um, but something about like receiving all these like fragments made me really want to like piece them together even if it wasn't in like a physical quilt way um and so yeah I guess I I, I kind of both felt like intimidated working with this work because it felt like holy material um and still does um but also like invited to maybe like lean into making a quilt maybe in ways that I haven't before um or um yeah maybe like bring some of that inspiration and legacy to the forefront um in in ways that have it hasn't maybe shined through in the past wonderful so I actually hadn't considered Rosie and quilting uh with this improvisation maybe but mostly it's it was the idea of pieces pieces of life pieces of cloth pieces of breath which isn't really a piece but small moments and the layering and to be able to layer on um from a shirt collar to a cuff to the buttons to the things that are identifiable and then pieces so small they're no longer identifiable but, but they still fit into the whole Wonderful. Well, um, to speak to Angela's question, um, the whole idea of uh, Rosie and, and um, how, how, how I, or how one can connect with her spirit of creativity is through, um, let's see, how do I put this? Um, resistance, uh, a bit of protest, you know, fortitude, because, you know, uh, women, people of color, the whole idea of being an artist and communicating your emotions and feelings isn't something that is welcomed by the dominant culture. So you have the courage to say, I'm going to use a marginalized material and say that that doesn't matter. You know, I'm just going to work, I'm going to use what I have. I'm going to use my, my sense of color and patterns to create something no one has seen before. And to say that I'm not gonna be stopped by 
the naysayers who say, well, you know, that you know, it, it won't go any further than your than your uh, than your uh, bed like a bedspread. It won't hang in in in, in uh, the, the uh, gallery walls or museum walls. But I I feel like in Zapatico and in um, and in defiance with Rosie and all the other um, beautiful women and powerful women uh, with their powerful creativity to say, I resist, I protest. I put my work out there. And that's when I was, and so when I think of uh, my work as, uh, you know, a male working with, you know, fabric, I, I too am resisting, but, you know, men are supposed to work with, with you know, with, with cloth or something that's not considered fine art material. And I, you know, I feel like, it's, you know, in um, strong union with Rosie and, and her, and her, uh, just uh, gumption to say, you know what? It doesn't matter what people say. It doesn't matter if they say no. I'm going to do it anyway. And, they, and, and along with a, a um, you know a symphony of hundreds of women or more, thousands of women of, uh, who do who are and have done the same thing. Absolutely. Yeah, and the scale, like you said, the 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 energy behind the works at BAM PFA and the scale that she set out um, is something that is just so breathtaking. Um, it's, it's, it's unbelievably profound. It's wonderful. Yeah. Well, this might be an, a nice moment to just say thank you again to our artists. Um, Angela Hennessy, Rama Khan, R O R Wisters, Olayatan, Calendar Scott, Lucasa Branfman, Verissimo. Thank you so much for again just taking the invitation to explore this material and to to bring it life. And you've you've done so much with it. It's incredible to see each of your each of your um, work right now as it is, and can't wait to continue to check in and see how it's developing. Um, we will continue to share the work as it comes comes into being, and uh, we'll we'll kind of be doing some updates on the museum's Instagram page as time as the as the becomes the right time. But for now, as uh, we, we heard from some of the artists, there's op opportunities to check in with their work um, in person. So again, Rama Khan at the at the Headlands. Um, Right now, Lucasa has curated a show at Southern Exposure, which is a really spectacular effort and a uh, collection of, of artists coming together in that space and also has work in an art show at Part Two Gallery that is opening this Saturday. And Angela, among other things, I'm sure, and mentioned also in August having a show at Part Two Gallery. Olaitan, um, perhaps you can let us know what, what opportunities to encounter your work there are uh, in the near future I will. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, and and please be in touch. Um, again, we this is hopefully the beginning of a a, a longer conversation and, and process of sharing. And um, yeah, thank you for tuning in. And it's it's just a, been a been a pleasure to check in with you all. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you all.